Dr. Jason Saunders here, and today we're gonna to talk about hyperbaric's effect on the mitochondria specifically. In a previous video, we covered the short-term and long-term effects of hyperbaric, and a lot of the long-term effects of hyperbaric oxygen on our cells is very specifically through a shifting or improving mitochondrial function. And so that's what we're gonna cover in much more detail today. In terms of the mitochondria itself, what is the mitochondria? The mitochondria is what we learned in eighth grade biology, the powerhouse of the cell. But really what it is, is the cell's engine. And just like in your car, an engine requires fuel and it requires oxygen. So if it can bring fuel and oxygen, and not just any fuel, it has to be the right fuel and the right mixture of fuel to oxygen, the right ratio, it can then create combustion. And when it creates combustion, the result of combustion is power and heat. And then there's waste products that are associated with combustion, which are carbon dioxide and water. And in our cells, it's a very similar process. It's not combustion, but it's metabolism. And through the process of metabolism, we combine the fuel that we eat with the oxygen that we breathe. And all those ingredients need to get to the mitochondria. And then with those ingredients, the mitochondria is able to produce energy. And so just like in an engine, there needs to be an intake, a way to suck air and oxygen into the cylinder of the engine. And then there needs to be a mechanism for power. Like I said, the engine, that's combustion in your cell. It's called metabolism. And then there needs to be exhaust. And if any of those systems aren't working properly, the engine won't work well. In other words, if you had all the right fuel going into the engine and you had a spark plug and the compression was working, but there was no oxygen, we'll never get the right power output. If you had oxygen and no fuel, you still won't have the right output. If you had oxygen and fuel and you had no exhaust system, it still wouldn't work properly. So we need all of those systems working properly in order for that engine to create the right and appropriate amount of power needed to move the car. And the same is true inside your cells. The mitochondria need the fuel and the right fuel. Different fuel that you put in your mouth has a different effect on mitochondrial function. It needs the right amount of oxygen and it needs to create the power. And then it also has an exhaust system. It needs to be able to get rid of waste products. And a breakdown in any of those cycles inside the cell will lead to a decrease in ATP production and mitochondrial performance. And so if we looked at the stoichiometry of gasoline in your engine, uh, it would look unbelievably similar uh, conceptually to the breakdown of you know, fuel inside your body. The stoichiometry is the balanced chemical equation. What ingredients are we putting into the system? What's being generated? And ultimately on the other side of the equation it has to be a balanced equation. We need the exact right amount of exhaust products. And so if you had gasoline, which is a series of hydrogen and carbons, and you mix that with the right amount of oxygen inside your engine of your car, you would yield a certain amount of carbon dioxide and water. So in this case, it'd be isooctane, which is C8H18. So eight carbons, uh, 18 hydrogens. And you mix that with 12 and a half O2s oxygen. You're gonna, leap, you're gonna end with eight carbon dioxide and nine water. And what's really interesting about that is if you looked at glucose inside your body, we could burn glucose for energy. We could also burn fat for energy. But if you looked at glucose for energy, it would be C6H12O6, six glucoses, six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. And if you mix that with another series of six oxygens, you're gonna yield six carbon dioxide and six H2O, six water molecules. And so the chemistry of combustion and the chemistry of metabolism are unbelievably similar. And so legitimately the mitochondria does act as the engine of the cell in order to produce the energy that our cells need for normal function. Now, all of that is, is to say that the mitochondria can also make energy without oxygen, but it makes it very, very inefficiently. And it's really theoretically saved for emergency situations where oxygen levels might be low, but also in unhealthy cells, particularly let's say cancer cells, where the mitochondrial is very uh, dysfunctional. If the mitochondria can't produce ATP in the presence of oxygen, what starts to happen is you start to ferment lactose. And that system still does produce energy, but a small fraction of the amount of energy that you can produce uh, inside the mitochondria when everything is working properly. The whole point of eating, just like the whole point of breathing, is to get the right ingredients into the mitochondria. And if you look at, this is a very simplistic view of cellular respiration and energy production. But if you looked at what our body does, it brings in fuel 
And that could be done in, in glucose inside the cell or through fatty acid uh, beta oxidation uh, closer inside the mitochondria. But really what we're producing is two ingredients. We're producing carbon dioxide, which is the waste product of the fuel breakdown, which we talked about earlier, just like the engine. So the carbon dioxide comes from breaking down carbon. Uh, remember it was C6H12O6. So in your body, as you're breaking those carbon bonds, you're going to be releasing some of that C as CO2, carbon dioxide, as you exhale each breath. And then the other purpose is ultimately to create a product called NAD or NADH. And when NAD is the fuel source that actually goes into the inside, the deeper parts of the mitochondria to help produce energy. And so all the food you eat, whether it's uh, glucose based or fat based, the, you know, the food that you eat that's ultimately for energy purposes, the fuel that goes in is all going to be turned into some amount of NAD. And that NAD, as it moves through the different layers of the mitochondria, is really the energy dense packets that produce um, a gradient that allows the mitochondria to really produce the energy that it produces. And so inside the mitochondria, we have multiple steps and each step could be considered a potentially a rate limiting step of how much of these ingredients are going in. And ultimately, as a result of these ingredients being put into this factory, how much energy could be made. And with hyperbaric, we can calculate the dose specifically of oxygen. So we can say at, at this pressure, breathing this percentage of oxygen over this period of time. So basically pressure in atmospheres times the percentage of oxygen that you're breathing times the amount of minutes. That's a calculatable dose of what the patient would have been exposed to in terms of oxygen absorption uh, throughout their session. And with that dose, we can understand that as you upregulate the amount of oxygen that's inside your system, you could really push, it's called the electron transport chain, but you could really push that part of mitochondrial ATP production inside the electron transport chain because oxygen is the, the last acceptor of electrons inside that process and becomes a bottleneck of ATP production. So when we upregulate oxygen exposure inside ourselves or our patients, and that oxygen makes its way eventually into the mitochondria, and then that oxygen gets into the electron transport chain, and it's able to pass those electrons off to oxygen, ultimately really just to make water, but also to help produce the ATP that it needs, that could really generate a much higher amount of ATP efficiency, uh, mitochondrial efficiency, and so we can get more energy out of that process. Just like in your engine of your car, people add a cold air intake, and the whole purpose of that is to drive more oxygen into the engine because we know when more oxygen gets in, it burns a hotter fire, creates more power. And the same is true inside of our bodies and inside of our cells. And so as we get exposed to hyperbaric, every session, that upregulation of free floating oxygen that we talk about so often in hyperbaric medicine, right away, that gets dumped into the mitochondria to increase the, the performance. Now, as you get repetitive exposures of hyperbaric oxygen into the mitochondria, there's a few other adaptations that occur. One, the mitochondria will start to grow in size so that it's able to actually um, utilize more and more of the oxygen that you're bringing in. But even more importantly, as it, as it increases in size and as a result increases in efficiency and makes more energy, if there's repetitive hyperbaric exposures, your body will actually grow more mitochondria. You'll increase mitochondrial density, which is an amazing effect. Imagine you had a car with one engine and now all of a sudden your car has two engines or three engines or four engines. The amount of power that a cell can generate when it has more mitochondria is enormous, you know, and in certain cases, a lot of cases where we're talking about chronic illness and inside that issues of chronic illness are often mitochondrial dysfunction or even mitochondrial disease. But if we had mitochondria, let's say we had 10 mitochondria and all 10 of those mitochondria only really worked at 50 or 60 percent effectiveness. And as a result of the initial exposures of hyperbaric, we could take that 50 or 60 percent effectiveness and bring that to 70 or 80. That would be a huge change. But what if instead of 10 mitochondria, we had 20 or 40 or 50 all working at 70 or, or 80 percent? All of a sudden, the amount of energy that that cell can produce becomes exponentially higher as a result. And so really, that's the big piece of what hyperbaric has to do with influencing mitochondrial function. And then ultimately, of course, ATP production. And then that's across all your cell types. So whether that's a liver cell or a brain cell or an intestinal cell or a skin cell, all of the cells that utilize oxygen for energy production are affected by this process. You know, it's one of the reasons why hyperbaric is not a cure for just about anything that we use it for, but it is so foundational because as you increase cellular performance, that's where we get optimization of our biology. 
or the ability to heal and recover and regenerate from, from injuries or chronic illness. I hope that helps. I hope that helps explain some of the basics behind the exact mechanism for how does hyperbaric influence mitochondrial function. In the next video, what we'll do is we'll go over more details about the cell signaling a uh, cascade of events that occurs from the repetitive hyperbaric exposures. Thanks again, and I uh, will see you next time.